Hello and welcome to Popcorn Mumbles, where we dig into the back catalog to select a film or television show to rewatch. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Eel. What's going on, guys? This week we have chosen the 1971 film, The French Connection. New York detective Popeye Doyle and his partner chase a French heroin smuggler. The French Connection was released on October 9th, 1971. On a budget of $2 million, it made $41 million. It has a Rotten Tomato score of 96% and an audience score of 87%. So, Todd, let's discuss The French Connection. Spoilers are ahead. Let's do it. So, Todd, The French Connection is ranked number 70 on AFI's 100 Greatest American Movies of All Time. Do you consider it one of the 100 Greatest American Movies of All Time, and why or why not? You know, I, I think he might earn that spot. I think it's it's good it's on that list. You know, you think about all the movies that's been made, and you pick in the top 100, and this is, even if it's just number 70, I mean, you know, that's a good spot. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's definitely one of those, like if you're, um, let's say you're a film student, and you, and you you run down a list of, like, must-see films, like this is definitely one of those that's on it. It's always mm-hmm. kind of been heralded as, like, a, uh, a piece of uh, filmmaking history, and we'll kind of get into reasons why, but... It's kind of to, to get us a little bit into this, Todd. Let me let me paint you a picture, okay? Okay. Let me, let me take you back. Okay. It's the it's the gritty 1970s. Mm-hmm. It's so gritty, everything looks like it has grain on it. Gotcha. It's that gritty, and we've got Jimmy Popeye Doyle. Gotcha. Uh huh. And his partner Buddy Cloudy Russo. Gotcha. They're they're New York deco- uh, narcotics detectives, mm-hmm. right? They're investigating. They're undercover. Right. They're roughing up minorities. <laughs> they're, okay. They're asking people if they're picking their feet in Poughkeepsie. Gotcha. That, that's the stage that we're set on, gotcha. Todd. So, uh, Todd, I want to compare. How would you describe the character of Popeye Doyle? He's almost, I wouldn't quite say full anti-hero, but he's a lot of what you see, I think, in American cinema back in this period in the 70s. You've got your... Uh, you pop out doors. You've got your Dirty Harry Callahan's. Uh, Serpico's. Serpico's. You've got your uh, Charles Bronson Death Wish. You know, a lot of people that may haven't been around at that time, weren't born yet, or may not realize, but 19, early 70s, mid 70s American cinema was very, very dark. Yeah. Stuff like uh, yeah, Travis Bickle, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, Taxi Driver, The Deer Hunter. Yeah. So you kind of go from that 60s kind of uh, flower power, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of you know, kind of music and the music and making love was the sixties. Right? <laughs> right. And then you go into the films of the seventies and it was, it, it's, it's dark and gritty. And then you move to the eighties and it was like, let's clean it up. And right. you had like, you know, the video nasties and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And like the seventies was really that dark kind of gritty noir kind of time in filmmaking. And like, this could be, couldn't be more that yeah. and it couldn't be more reflective of its time i think for me i just jotted down these as i went about popeye Doyle. uh he's a a poor to decent detective gotcha i wouldn't say he's a great detective right. or a great cop he's tough he's obsessive he's an alcoholic yes he's a womanizer yep uh he's a racist yeah although not as much anymore which we'll talk about we'll talk about and uh, he's a terrible co-worker <laughs> Uh, for another reason we'll talk about when we talk about the ending of this film. Right. He's a terrible co-worker. Uh, so, Todd, you want to – this is – it's a hard movie. You know, normally we go kind of in-depth here and we, we kind of talk about the story and we get, you know, kind of uh, really, really deep into it. This is a movie It's really hard to do that because there's just a – it's a lot of uh, – it's a, it's a lot of police procedural stuff in a way. Yes. There's a lot of trailing people and there's a lot of like scenes without like dialogue and mm-hmm. those kind of things. So like not really to, able to kind of go into it as, as depthful as we would for most other stories that we kind of go through. But what would you say the plot of the French connection is? So basically, you just introduced these two uh, narcotics detectives, you know, Papa Doyle and his partner Russo. Yeah, one and, dressed up, Doyle dressed up as Santa Claus. Right, and I think uh, Russo was selling hot dogs at a hot dog cart. He was a hot dog vendor, yeah. Yeah, he, I think uh, he kind of gets the signal from Papa, you know, something's going on in there. So Russo heads into that building and uh, try to corral the guy. The guy kind of makes a run out the building. They got to chase him on foot. Uh, you know, Russo kind of corners him, gets a little bit too close, gets slashed in the arm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got to get him down, and the brutality begins. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they definitely, uh, again, they, they rough up some minorities in this yeah. movie, which is, uh, is a theme that we'll kind of come back to with something we talk about later. Uh, yeah, we kind of, at the beginning of the film, we see a, uh, we're in, we're in Marseille's. In France? In France, yeah. Uh, we see an undercover detective. He's just going home to check his mail. 
yep. uh, just a normal every day. And we see a uh, another French hitman that we'll uh, we'll kind of come to, to kind of know a little bit more about later. Just shoots him in the face point blank. Yes, and it's the the, the violence in this movie is very. Um, very matter of fact. Mm -hmm. So this is directed by William Friedkin, who would go on to direct some of the uh, the most notable films of all time, like The Exorcist, yes. which we've covered on the this channel before. Uh, but yeah, the violence here, like you just see right off the bat. I think they like that dude just is shot in the face, and I think he's just like they just spray, they just like spray him with like red paint, mm -hmm. and like it's it's like I really like it, and then it's like also it's a little bit. I think, uh, and I'll have, I'll have to put it in the clip here, but I think you can actually see the hose that they spray him with. Oh, really? Shot I didn't with catch the red it. paint. And okay. then when he falls, the, the spray on his face doesn't kind of match the uh the the spray that he was receiving in the close up okay. for the fall west shot but that's that's nitpicky because right. it's still effective <clears throat> it's still like blunt kind of matter of fact violence and that's what this film has it's not like overly done like movie violence you right. know or like that kind of thing like it's very matter of fact kind of blunt you're shot, you're down, you're dead. There's no like, there's no, no nothing cinematic about it at gotcha. all, which is something that I think is is a plus for this film. So I got ahead of myself. We see that first, and that's mm -hmm. when we come back to New York, New York. Yeah, <laughs> and we're introduced to uh, Popeye and his partner Russo, and get that first opening chase scene with their suspect. And then really, um, they kind of just luck into the plot of the French Connection. Yeah, they go to get a drink uh, after all the events that happened with the the, the foot down chase, and mm -hmm. they kind of go to a nightclub and a. You see kind of Popeye over there kind of hitting on a kind of a cocktail waitress. Yeah, there's our first womanizer, yeah. <laughs> uh, our hint that he's a womanizer. And he yeah. kind of looks over at this table and he sees, you know, some couple of familiar faces around a local drug scene sitting around that table. And he kind of makes his back way over to his partner and he's like, hey, it's, you know, there's a couple of this, couple of suspicious looking dudes over there. Right. And that, that one main guy, you know, he's, he's passing out money left and right. Yeah, and it's like, here's part of his character too. Like you could say it's obsessive, like... He's just, he's never just turning it off. Yeah. And then also it's like, I felt like watching it, I was like, it's almost like he's always, almost like he's jealous in a way too. Did you read any of that too? Because he's like, he's seeing how these, he's busting his ass, he's a cop. Yeah. And he's kind of seeing these assholes like pass around hundred dollar bills that mm -hmm. he knows are like dirty. So there's also like, I feel like a little component of yeah, like maybe a, a little that. bit of a deep seated like anger about mm -hmm. it and like a jealousy, which kind of goes into his character as well. But yeah, he just kind of looks onto the, to the plot because the guy passing out hundreds ends up being a dude named Sal Boca. Right. Him and his girlfriend, Angie run like a little newspaper and uh, sandwich, so, shop. sandwich <laughs> shop. Very, there was very specific uh, yeah. shops in New York apparently. Back you want a days. sub and a paper? <laughs> Come on down to Sal's, apparently. But, uh, yeah, so they kind of trail them for a little while, and they kind of see, like, kind of a drop-off, which they suspect they're dropping off drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of mentioned throughout the film, just kind of with the minorities they beat up and stuff, <laughs> that uh, – that New York is kind of dry right now, drug wise. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where uh, Popeye and uh, and uh, Cloudy kind of go in and kind of shake down another uh, little bar, and they kind of like they get virtually nothing. They get virtually nothing out, and Popeye kind of destroys all the stuff, puts it on the counter, and like mixes it up in a shaker glass and yeah. dumps it out on the counter. And they've got like an informant he goes in the bathroom and kind of talks to. But it's kind of mentioned that right now the city's kind of dry drug wise, at least heroin wise. And uh, the kind of informant tells them that they're supposed to be a shipment of something kind of coming in but no one really knows much about it yeah and that kind of further puts Popeye and them onto uh onto the kind of the trail of this uh French connection and um we see that the uh that Sal that with with them kind of trailing Sal and them again we see that kind of drop off that they had and then back in France we kind of keep following this character he's like an older gentleman mm -hmm. he's kind of going around it seems like they've roped in a kind of a French a, actor a failing French actor who's kind of fallen on some hard times financially and they've kind of roped him into the plot of doing something here for them which really you don't know exactly what he's doing for them for a while and that's really where you kind of get into the meat of the story like the thing about this film, too, it's like 
I know this is kind of based on based on true events and true story. There was yeah. two police detectives that this was kind of uh, you know this kind of happened to, and this story is kind of being told based on their experiences. And I think Gene Hackman and some of the the people behind the scenes actually wrote along with them and kind of seen how they operate and right. and, and those kind of things. And like in this film, like I know William Freakin, he was known for being like a kind of a documentary kind of style filmmaker. He wanted like realism and truth in it. And like you see a lot in this film of like you don't get a lot of exposition. There's not a lot of characters talking and telling you about themselves yeah. or their motivations mm-hmm. or how they feel. You're just kind of watching an events as they unfold. Right. And it's not like it's being spoon fed to you. And it's like part of the the thing with Popeye, like with his character, like that that really lends itself to that in a good way is like you're not you're it doesn't try to sway you one way or the other to like to be on his side or not be on his side. You're just kind of watching a guy go throughout his day and do his job. And then like events happen within that. Yeah. And it's like not your typical kind of Hollywood film where it would just be spoon fed to you. And they would try to make Popeye sympathetic in some way. His dad beat him and he was a drunk. Right. Right. Or something really bad happened in his past, even though there's, there's hints that we get from other agents that he somehow got another cop killed at some point. Yeah. There's tragic stuff that's probably happened in and around him, but like it's not spoon fed to you on a plate. Like it would be if they made, this this movie now yeah he'd be in his house crying and you know there'd there'd be flashbacks (laughs) to his father beating him and like all this kind of stuff but like it's you're just watching things as they unfold and you're kind of learning things as as you go about what the plot kind of is but basically these french guys they're wanting to bring over a shipment of heroin to the u.s they're the new supplier for the heroin or want to be the new supplier for heroin to the kind of uh, Sal Boca and his family and they're like kind of little crew. They're kind of mm-hmm. facilitating that deal from the French dudes. Right. Anything I'm missing there for the greater scheme of our plot no, before we kind of get into you, some notable scenes? I think you got the nuts and bolts right there. Yeah, and like I said, it, there's a lot within that, and we'll kind of go through some notable scenes because there's definitely some things to mention here, but that's kind of the meat of your plot. And then in between those, it's a lot of it's a lot of police work and detective work and trail this guy, trail that guy, and let's follow this guy in a car. Right. And let's go rough up this guy and get some information, <laughs> and then let's go back and do this, and like, hey, let's bang this girl on a bicycle, and then I'm chained in my bed, and it's a lot of little stuff like. Popeye the, had a thing for chicks with big old boots, big old I, tall I, boots. Tall boots. Yes, he tries to talk to that one girl that don't give him the time of day. Yeah. Then he sees a girl with like boots riding that on bicycle, a bicycle, yeah. and he's got some kind of boot fit. Yeah, I mean, to each their own. He's not a perfect man, folks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, just come some notable scenes here. We kind of already talked about the opening murder scene. Um, the only thing that I'll, I'll add to that one, uh, our killer, our hitman, he adds insult to injury because the guy's carrying a baguette. Tears off a piece of his baguette. He tears off a piece of his baguette and eats it as he walks this away. This motherfucker. How cold-blooded is that? <laughs> exactly. Uh, our main guy, it's, uh, I, I'm going to butcher his name. It's like Alan in a way, but it's like not spelled like Alan. Mm-hmm. And is it Charnay? Charnay? I think you're. How close. would you say it, Todd? You Char- studied think, French, right? Think, no, <laughs> but I think it's Charnay. I Char- think we'll go Charnay. Okay, all right. So um, there's again a lot of tailing suspects in this. Uh, a notable scene to me is the the tailing of Charnay. Uh, so later in the film, like everybody kind of they they've kind of set up surveillance. Popeye's kind of begged and pleaded for his kind of captain or his lieutenant to kind of give him the resources to do these warrants and wiretaps mm-hmm. and to give him some resources. And it's him and Cloudy, and there's a couple of uh, FBI agents along. A couple of feds, yeah. A couple of feds involved that uh, Popeye's not too happy w- about. Yeah, one of them could give a shit about Popeye. Yeah. He is not a fan of Popeye. Not a fan of him. His <laughs> name is uh, uh, Mulderig. Mulder? I think that was it, Something yeah. like that, which we'll get to him later. Don't worry. Uh, so uh, we kind of see that they, they've kind of set up the surveillance, like, outside of his hotel, Charnair's hotel. And we see that everybody kind of drops the ball because he's able to, like, freely walk out of his hotel mm-hmm. without any surveillance, just as Popeye's kind of walking up. So Popeye starts to tail him. Uh, they ultimately leads to uh, Popeye kind of tailing him into the subway. Subway, And yeah. they have this little game of, like, I'm getting on the subway. I'm just kidding. No, yeah. I'm not. I'm getting on. No, I'm not. <laughs> Like, but that may go on a little bit too it long. It may, it may. <laughs> now, I will say that, yeah, I, I, I cannot uh, dispute that. That may be a little bit too much of yeah. that, but uh, it is, it is good because you know. Uh, 
through some of the comments that Charnier and his partner kind of make and some of the stuff, you know, they're all, he remarks about Sal kind of uh, seeing police in his soup. They all know that they're being watched yeah. by the FBI at one point yeah. uh, or, or by the feds and by the, the police. And at one point they have to like meet in Washington, Sal and Charnay and all this kind of stuff. So they know they're being watched. But yeah, their little game of like cat and mouse on the subway, it may go on a little bit too long, but I still like the scene kind of oh, yeah. ultimately. Like all the, the trailing stuff, like you, there's a lot of it, but I never thought it got too, it, it was never too much. Like I understood it. Like, in the in the context of the story, but like just their little game of like, eh? Yeah. Eh? Eh? And then as Papa, of course, misses the train and the Frenchman kind of you know, gives him that little that little wave. Bye bye, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Which we'll come back to. And I think I was I was watching an interview last night with Gene Hackman about the movie made several years ago, maybe around the thirtieth anniversary. And he was talking about that actually happened to the detective in real life and that like that I think either was or could have been used to indict that guy because mm -hmm. that was his way of signaling that he knew he was being trailed by the police. Right. Uh, just this something I, I learned last night by watching that. Um, Todd, if you have any scenes in between this, let me know. But the next one I wanted to talk about. Uh, there was one I wanted to mention. I think it happens before the subway scene, and that's when uh, the Frenchman and his hitman go in and eat in that fancy restaurant. Mm -hmm. And you get kind of getting those perspectives of them sitting inside eating, you know, New York's finest, and you shoot out the Popeye, freezing his ass off, watching him out there eating like a cold piece of pizza and some drinking some shitty coffee. Don't he pour out the coffee? He pours out the coffee because it's so bad, but he's, you know, and, you know, that wasn't acting. They did this shit in the freezing cold back when they shot this. I was just going to say in that interview, yeah, Gene Hackman talked about he'd never shot so much outdoors, and it was like in the freezing cold in New York. So He's like, standing there shuffling his feet because yeah. they were fucking freezing. Yeah, they were freezing. Yeah, it's a good kind of juxtaposition between you see what the, the cops are having to go through. And again, I think it leads into that little bit of that anger. That jealousy. And that, that jealousy, anger. like mm -hmm. watching this dude in there fucking eating, you know, steak and caviar or whatever. And I'm outside eating a dollar slice and a fucking shitty coffee. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a good juxtaposition there. Uh, the next thing I wanted to, th to talk about, I hadn't seen this movie in a while. I'd seen it before, probably twice, but I hadn't seen it in a very long time. Yeah. So I kind of forgot most of what happens, most of the plot. Um, the sniper scene. That got me. Yeah. So, like, at one point, basically our French fellas, they're basically in the clear because the lieutenant's like, hey, you've been doing all this surveillance. We mm -hmm. wasted all this manpower, and we got shit for it. We got no bus. We're no closer to yeah. getting you're in. You're off the special case. Yeah, you're off the special assignment. So, as uh, but... At the at the same time, our, our hitman guy, the one that blew uh, the uh, the cop's face off in the very beginning of the the movie, is like, "Hey, I can take care of this problem if you want to." He's like, "I know we're out of here on Friday. We're going to do this deal and go back, but you know, shouldn't we kill a New York police officer and draw more <laughs> attention on ourselves?" Sure. Yeah. So uh, as Popeye's kind of returning home, uh, he's kind of like walking through. There's other people in his neighborhood. He's going back to his apartment building. There's a sniper on the roof, and he takes a shot at him, but ends up hitting a woman. Pushing a baby in a stroller. Right. And I'm like, damn, this is the 1970s, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Because, like, cold blooded. Cold blooded. As you just this, this poor, innocent bystander woman and her child, she's just pushing a baby in a stroller and gets assassinated, basically. And you see Popeye, he kind of heads to the roof just in time to see the, the gunman running away on foot. But it's just like, I don't feel like you see that. You wouldn't see it, and you wouldn't see it in the same way if it was done today. No. It would just be hinted at off screen. You'd see him like line up the shot, and then cut to uh, you know somebody eating a apple somewhere, and you'd hear the gunshot. Like yeah, it yeah. wouldn't be shown anymore. No, no, and, no. And another thing about Popeye's character, does he check on the lady? No. Does he call for help? No. Does he do anything? He immediately goes after the sniper. Yeah, he could give two shits about this <laughs> this dead mother that's laying on the ground. Again, that that's part of his character. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it as we go forward. Um, but that leads to uh, the train chase. So the, the foot chase eventually leads us to one of the most talked about and referenced films and scene and uh, film history, Todd. Uh, Probably one of the things that led me to watch this film originally. I had always heard this is one of the most if not the most epic chase scenes ever filmed for a movie. Yep. The, so the car chase, Popeye ends up losing the gunman when he boards the train. So Popeye kind of commandeers some poor bastard's car and uh, starts chasing the train. So Todd, I'll let you have first crack at this scene. What are your, what are your thoughts on the car chase? Uh, I mean, it's, if it's not the best, it's up there. It's just the way I think the way it's filmed, the way it's shot. Uh, 
I actually read that one of those uh, little wrecks that happens in that scene, that wasn't supposed to happen. Yeah, I think he actually ended up hitting into it like a stunt car. Yeah. Like, uh, so just some of the background information here. Just there, There's a great article. I kind of pulled some of this uh, stuff from, from uh, Slash Film. Uh, but it said, William Freakin's directing in this film has been called guerrilla style, which is very accurate. It's very, like, guerrilla style, very documentary style. Uh, and... Bill Hickman, who plays Bill Molderick, who plays our FBI agent, mm-hmm. uh, he was actually doing a lot of the driving work. There's some where it was Gene Hackman for some mm-hmm. of the shots, but he was actually doing a lot of the driving work with Freak and working the camera over his shoulder because I guess he was like a he had uh, Hickman was a kind of a stunt driver in his past. I think he did some of the driving for like the Goon Car and Bullet. Oh yeah, in '68, which people, another good chase which scene. Which people yeah. kind of remarked was the best chase scene until this one kind of yeah. came out. But just uh, just some information here. This has been covered, I'm sure, a thousand times. There's probably a thousand videos people talk about breaking this. So you'll you'll hear nothing new here, folks. But <laughs> uh, just to add context to our video here, to, so to choose to, the, to shoot the chase sequence, they had a siren mounted on the car, freaking and worked the chase out beforehand with his actors, including the woman pushing a baby carriage who Papa almost hits, but he neglected to tell the driver Hickman that. Uh, freaking was able to shoot some scenes on the overhead train Papa was chasing by bribing an official with $40,000 and a get-out-of-town ticket to Jamaica. <laughs> so the guy worked for like you know the trans you know transit authority yeah. or something like I that. I heard that he freaking had no permits for that shot. None of that. None of that because the guy <laughs> he said you know he he told the guy what he needed and the guy mm-hmm. said well to do it I need forty thousand dollars I needed one way ticket to Jamaica and he's like why one way he's like because when your film comes out I'm gonna be fired and that's exactly <laughs> what happened right because they let him just do this shit. Yeah. Uh, freaking did have crew members uh, and off duty cops working to help him contain the situation so it wasn't like he just stuck a runaway car in traffic with no uh, buffers. However, there was no official traffic control and at least one unscripted collision with another stunt vehicle occurred, which you mentioned. Um, and apparently freaking in his gorilla style filmmaking zeal uh, recognized how hard he was gambling, which is why he was working the camera. Since as a bachelor, he could afford to die young, unlike some of the other family men in his crew. Man. And this article kind of posed a really good question that I'll, I'll pose to you. It says, The French Connection remains a classic, and watching the above chase with the knowledge of how it was filmed does raise the tension of it. But would it be any less great if it had been filmed under less perilous conditions? Did the real-life danger somehow contribute to the film's visceral power, or could it have been made to just look as uh, just look as authentic uh, with some movie magic so that's the question i'll post to you todd is it good because of the real life danger or would it have been just as good if it was if you didn't know that it was like kind of as dangerous it was it really potentially was in real life hmm. good question <laughs> it is something to think it's about something to think about I, I think the way that it's actually i think the way that it's framed i think the way that it's shot I think it could have still been a great chase scene without the sense of danger. I think knowing that there was that sense of danger, I th- I'll be honest, I think it and adds a little bit. It, that makes yeah. it, I think. Like, it, it is, I mean, like, just visually, it looks like there's some great shots. There's like a, that, that kind of like almost like mounted to the bottom bumper mm-hmm. kind of like seeing through traffic as you're almost hitting stuff. Like, it, it it's filmed fantastically. but just very frantic. Knowing that it was, frantic. like, not really, should have not went down and there was a real element of danger to it, like, on the day. It adds to it. How does it not? definitely <laughs> adds to it. Like, could it have been just as good? I don't... Th- Visually, it could have been, but as its impact goes and its lasting impact on right, the film, exactly. it would have not been as good. It, yeah. it would have been not as talked about as much as if, if it didn't have the element of danger, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, the next scene I want to mention, unless you got anything in between here, Todd, uh, is the wave. And what I mean by that oh, the is, wave. yes, so uh, eventually the, the plot is discovered where Popeye and, and Cloudy, they're kind of, they're, they're telling this guy and they figure out that the, uh, uh, they're moving some of this product in a dirty car, a dirty car. So there's like a, uh, a car and it's got like French or uh, like, you know, out of country, like French, uh, you yeah. know, kind of tags plates, on it. Yeah. So they end up following that car to where it's kind of dropped off by sound. It's just kind of left there and they kind of stake it out overnight. 
and uh, there's a car full of uh, some Hispanic folks that kind of come around, which we'll come back to this scene a little bit later. Okay. They kind of come <laughs> around to, uh, they're just there to kind of get some, get the tires off of it and kind of break it down and try to get some, you know, some scrap metal off yeah. of it. Basically. I think they go by like three times and on a third time Popeye's like they've been around three times exactly get them get them get them yeah (laughs) exactly so they they go they arrest them they take them away they end up hauling the car in they end up tearing the the damn thing to pieces they tear out every part of it and and the guy at the garage is like I if there's anything in it, I can't find yeah. it. You're more than welcome to look for it yourself, Popeye. I love that scene because, you know, they've tore that thing apart. They've looked everywhere. And, you know, Russo's got the manifest, and he's like, he's talking about the weight and about how, you know, factory is supposed to weigh, I think, 4,600. Mm-hmm. Yeah, coming into the country, it was like 4,700. 4,795, yeah. yeah. And that, and the guy that was there helping the whole time, he's like, "Well, I tore everything out, but the rocker panels." <laughs> and <he's> like, <laughs> Popeye's like, "What's that? What, Irv? what the fuck? Tear Irv? them out, you dumb fuck!" So they go <laughs> he don't and say that. <laughs> <laughs> they go and tear out the rocker panels, and sure enough, that's where there's the a hundred twenty pounds of heroin <laughs> stuffed into the rocker panels mm-hmm. of this car. Uh, because the thing, everybody kind of chastises uh, Popeye through the film about some. His, sometimes his hunches ain't hitting on yeah, shit, right? And this is a hunch that he kept following kept following for a minute you there you think well maybe this is maybe just another ain't it. maybe this ain't it but he knew the car was dirty and there was 120 pounds of heroin stuffed in the rocker panels so they uh at the same time this is where our actor friend comes in because i guess he was supposed to he was supposed to take possession of that car and come and find drive that it car to that warehouse and drive yeah. it to the warehouse for, to meet uh sal boca and his crew yeah. and exchange the car for money uh, so he's there at the like police impound or whatever, and to he's like, the car. "Where's my car?" And they're kind of like, you know, trying to find the car. And when they figure out, I guess he's there, they send Cloudy to kind of meet him. So the thing that you had to kind of suspend your disbelief is how the fuck they put that car back together. <laughs> That's Todd. exactly what I've always thought about this movie: is how do they get that damn car put back together so quick? I was researching <laughs> last night, and people have the same question. And there's like, there's like, you know, uh, your comment mechanics that are out there that be like, "I can put a car back together." Like, is it possible? Right. Sure, it might be possible, but you have to suspend the disbelief. I think in my mind, like, I don't even know which is more plausible to me, that they put that car back together after the scenes we see of them ripping the shit out of it, or they had a lookalike car. They had exact but make then, and model, maybe. Then you have to get to the then you have to get into the nitpicky stuff of like, well, if you replaced the car, you also have to replace like the ignition key because he would there would only be a key that they would have right. that would that would start it. So they'd have to replace that. You get into the weeds and you get really nitpicky. Mm-hmm. Just to spend your disbelief a little bit, folks, yeah. with this one. Like that's that's your real big if you want to say it's a plot hole. That's the only one I think I can find in this right. movie. Right. Yeah. I was watching it last night and I'm like, when I saw that car go back out and, and you know, uh, him get in it, I'm like, how the fuck they put that thing back together? <laughs> they tore everything and they weren't gentle about it. Mm, they weren't like, they, they were, were ripping. They were popping those welds off the rocker panels and like ripping shit out and like cutting into the sides of yeah. like, you know, the fabrics and stuff. I'm like, there's, there's no way in that. <laughs> if they would have had a scene where Cloudy is like, you know, where, they, that dude to come back f- four days later or something. Maybe, Maybe I could have bought it. Give us a week, man. Yeah, give us a week. We know where your car is. We got a lot of cars uh, here. Yeah, we got we got we got to bring it down from Poughkeepsie. <laughs> uh, should we mention? Uh, we didn't really mention the picking your feet in Poughkeepsie thing. I mentioned it in my little uh, setting the the stage, but the picking your feet in Poughkeepsie thing. So, so apparently, at the at the beginning of the movie, that's one of the things that uh, Popeye gets that a uh, suspect they're uh, kind of giving the once over about. He's like, "You ever been to Poughkeepsie? You been to Poughkeepsie, ain't you? You on a bed in Poughkeepsie picking your feet? You ever what? picked your feet in Poughkeepsie?" <laughs> When's the last time you picked your feet? Huh? What's he talking about? I've got a man in Poughkeepsie who wants to talk to you. You ever been to Poughkeepsie? Huh? Have you ever been to Poughkeepsie? Hey, man. Come on, give me a break. Hey, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me hear you say it. Come on. Have you ever been to Poughkeepsie? You've been to Poughkeepsie, haven't you? No. I want to hear it. Come on. Yes, yes, yes I, I've been. You've been there, right? Yeah, yeah. You sat on the edge of the bed, didn't you? You took off your shoes, put your finger between your toes, and picked your feet, didn't you? Now say it. Yes. All right. You yes. put a shield on my partner. You know what that means? God damn it. All went wrong, I gotta listen to him gripe about his bowling scores. Now, I'm gonna bust your ass for those three bags, and I'm gonna nail you for picking your feet in Poughkeepsie. 
And apparently what I had read that this was something that the actual, uh, I think his name was Eddie Egan, who mm-hmm. Popeye was based off of. It's just something that he would do to suspects. He would ask them these crazy, off-the-wall, stupid-ass questions to kind of get them rattled, get them, you know, yeah. nervous. They wouldn't know how to respond to those questions because how do you respond in the middle of a cop berating you, asking yeah. about, did you pick your feet but Yeah. <laughs> so you don't know how to respond to that. And when, you're, when your partner in this film, Cloudy, says, hey, ask you a real question, you're more apt to answer that question because yeah. it's it, it's straightforward you right. understand it as opposed to where well, you're picking your feet and yeah. you. so like you bring in some real life elements that really mm. happen you that really, really used happen, to do yeah. shit like that mm-hmm. the, the real life detective so like it brings in stuff a lingering question I have I had it in my note after I had to look up after the movie is like why do they throw that straw hat in the back glass and I looked that up oh yeah it's because apparently at the time uh, that was a way to signal to I guess other like police that might have pulled you over or something like that 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 you were undercover cops Gotcha. On, you know, okay. on, on duty is putting a straw hat in the bag. I knew know? it had to be a signal for something, but I didn't yeah, know Yeah, I, I was a lingering question I had after, but yeah, there's a scene where he tells him, you know, kind of gives Cloudy a straw hat and they throw it in the back and uh, it's there because it signals that you're, you know, kind of undercover at the time. Yeah. In, the, in the 70s, that was the signal, put a straw hat in the back glass. Uh, but getting back to uh, the notable scene, I was talking about the wave. So, as uh, Charnier, he takes the car since the the actor can no longer do it. He kind of he gets cold feet about he gets the whole scared, thing. Yeah. They have a little meeting, and he's like, ah, "I can't do this." I'm and done. He's like, "Well, what about more money?" And he's like, "Nah, nah, I will nah I, I'm do- I'm good." Uh, the police are involved. I'm out. So Charnier ends up having to be the one that takes the uh, the actual car to uh, Sal and to the the little meeting at that like kind of these like decrepit buildings and stuff they have like a little garage or warehouse or something Mm -hmm. so they take them out there they do the meat they pop the rocker panels they put the drugs back in there for them they have their little chemist guy test it um, from what I understand, that was real heroin that they tested on screen. Oh, shit. They, instead of doing core starch, <laughs> uh, apparently from what I read, that was real heroin okay. that, that used in that scene. Nice rap party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> William freaking know how to treat his crew, Todd. Um, but uh, so uh, uh, Charnair, they, they exchange the money for the drugs. Charnair ends up being driven away by Sal, takes him, tells him when he's going to give him a ride. Uh, they come to the bridge. They come to the end of the bridge, and they see Popeye and a legion of police officers have, brought, has, have blocked the bridge off. And we see Popeye kind of coming forward and giving Charnay that little wave that back. Little, the wave like, back. Hey, asshole. You got, got you remember, after all. Remember, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> remember me from the subway? Um, and Sal ends up kind of freaking out. He kind of backs up, r- drives uh, him and Charnay back to the little warehouse where they were. And uh, that's when the kind of police descend upon them. They have a, a shootout there. Um, really the thing I note, I think about the shootout again, some good kind of, uh, kind of that, you know, as I talked about that kind of blunt kind of matter of fact violence, really the big takeaway is, uh, Sal kind of gets cut in half by, oh, by, yeah. by Cloudy and, yeah. his, and his shotgun blast to his, I think it was like his stomach, I, I think, think wasn't so. yeah, it? Midsection, definitely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, everybody, when you get shot in this movie, it looks like you, you hit with a can of tomato soup, <laughs> <laughs> but it works. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. I'm not knocking it at all. Um, but from the shootout, we get um, Charnair, he he takes off the other way. Yeah. While everybody else is having a shootout with the cops, he takes off to some decrepit abandoned building, which Popeye kind of follows him into. Right. And he kind of forgoes the shootout to kind of chase Charnair. And he goes into this little rundown building, and they begin searching for him. And it's just Popeye for a while. And we know as an audience, we know that uh, Agent Mulderig has kind of entered that building, and he's kind of shuffling around. Right. We see that Cloudy comes in, and he kind of introduces and like lets him like, lets his, his presence be known to Popeye. Popeye almost shoots him, but doesn't. And he kind of lets himself be known. And as they're going through the building. Popeye thinks he spots Charnair in a doorway and opens fire, blasts all six shot of, mm-hmm. shots at this figure in the doorway. And is it Charnair, Todd? No, it's the federal agent. It's the federal agent, Motorik. Yes. And he's, Cloudy goes over to him as he's dying. And he tells him, hey, you shot fucking Motorik. <laughs> this is not Charnair. This is not the you Frenchman. You shot Motorik. Right. And Popeye, again, could give two fucks. <laughs> And I'd completely forgotten about the ending of this film, and mm-hmm. I completely did not remember that yeah. fucking Popeye murders a cop. <laughs> he murders a federal agent. A federal agent. And, I mean, I don't think in the context of the story you're led to believe this, but it's like they never got along anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, is there some kind of context that you could kind of bring out that maybe he knew what he was doing in a way? Right. Like, is Popeye that big of a scumbag? Like, 
it's not it, the film doesn't want you to like go down that avenue, but as an audience member, you kind of a lingering question is like, did he know? Maybe yeah, he did. I right. could I could rationalize you know rationalize that to me, but uh, I was not expecting the ending in this film because after that. He's just like, you know, Cloudy's trying to tell him, like, hey, you killed Mulderig. And he's like, he's I know still he, down here somewhere. He's still here somewhere. I'm gone. <laughs> Let me reroad <laughs> six more shots into this revolver and I'm gone. And you see him kind of go down a corridor. He goes into a hallway, cuts in. You hear a single gunshot. One more shot. And then we go to black. And that's it. And then we're told by the the ending of the film, we're told in a kind of a postscript that uh, Charnier was never caught and Popeye and Cloudy were transferred out of the Narcotics Bureau and reassigned. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you're kind of left with like, what was that last shot about? How do you interpret that, that last gunshot? I mean, I kind of read it's one of those things that I think freaking kind of left to kind of be your own, you know, fill in your own blank here. Right. Was he just shooting at shadows? Was he so far gone he was just shooting at anything that moved, a rat, a shadow? Did he maybe fire, did he maybe actually see Charnier, fire a shot, but he still got away? Right. If there wasn't a French connection to, in my mind, I would place on it that he killed himself. Yeah. That's in my mind where right. the story would go. That's just me putting my own head can into it. Did he know he was gone because he just killed a federal agent? Did he go down there in the cover of darkness to kill himself? And did it hit him? Like, right. did it, it may have not registered, but then did it register to him as he was mm-hmm. like still going? And I've never seen French Connection too, but like it, its existence now pisses me off <laughs> because I want to kind of assign that to it because, you know, the, if I think the weakest part of the film is that postscript because right. it takes away some of the mystery about what happened to Popeye mm-hmm. and what happened to Cloudy and all mm-hmm. this kind of stuff. I kind of wish, um, kind of like we talked about before with um, um, Owner Majesty's Secret Service, right. how that ending is kind of supplanted and ruined a little bit by that, like, popping up that Bond music right gotcha. at the end at that somber. Like, to me, I wish they'd have just left off that postscript. And just we just there. faded to black to credits from that last shot. I agree. At least you would have had four years before the French Connection 2 to come out to think, like, did Popeye just kill himself? I actually watched French Connection Did he Connection shoot Charnay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, but then if 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 yeah. that didn't exist or that postscript there, then you're then you could at least in your head did he kill, kill himself? Did he shoot Charnay? Right. Did he shoot another cop? Yeah. They come into hey pop up bang 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 bang. <laughs> you know what I mean? I get it. it. It was it would be left more up to your own mind to decide rather than have you know the postscript of what happened to all these characters. Yeah, and I mean it, it does the postscript. To be fair, the postscript does reflect what really happened in real life. That guy was never caught. Mm-hmm. Those kind of things. Um, you know that those officers, the real life officers. I think the I think Eddie Egan that you mentioned. I think he kind of got out of the police work and kind of got into Hollywood for a while, but then like I think some charges were brought against him because there was a lot of like at the time this was a big publicized kind of story mm-hmm. and there was a lot of um what's the word I'm looking for? There was a lot of scrutiny about their methods oh, and yeah. the things that they did, which is again why kind of Popeye's kind of posed as he is. Um but uh yeah that's that's kind of the it just Again, if you change that ending just a little bit, like again, it might be a nitpick for for to some, but like I think it just would have lurked slightly better. But still, I can't knock it overall. Like it, it doesn't it doesn't ruin it in any way for me. Um, for a, a question I was going to ask you here, any chance that that Buddy Russo Cloudy is uh, Martin Brody? <laughs> Could be because he came from he New came York. He came from right? New York. I was just oh. maybe uh, maybe shit went bad sometimes. He and he got a uh, he had to take on witness, a whole new yeah, identity, witness protection or something, and he Ooh. became uh, chief of Anamity Island. That's, 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 <laughs> Any possibility of that? I like to think maybe. No, uh, <laughs> before I go on to the next topic, talk anything you want to discuss before we discuss the re-editing of this, this film? I just want to mention what I think is definitely a character in this movie that doesn't get mentioned because it's not a living, breathing character, but that's 1970s New York. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was a time, folks, where New York City in the 1970s, uh, you know, it wasn't the safest place to live. <laughs> it, it reads dangerous yeah, on yeah. film. Like, it really... It's it's not a nice looking place. It's not a you know it, it it's not the cleanest. It's yeah. not. It had 
the perfect vibe for a gritty 70s cop movie. Yeah, I mean, that you know, that first time we see Popeye and his partner and they chase that guy into that just kind of derelict looking building mm-hmm. section there where there's like a, just a fire on the ground for no reason. Yeah, that wasn't on a set, that was in New York. Yeah, they didn't have money for sets. This yeah. was like, a, I think, a two million dollar yeah. budget. Uh, I think I read like they didn't have money for sets, there was no sets built for this, like, this was all just filmed as he is yeah. like, that's real to new york so like this was very very gritty very crime ridden uh, summer of sam type stuff <laughs> yeah and you'll never you know there's been films like one that just pops in my head like joker and stuff that you mm-hmm. can recreate that but you'll never recapture it the way it actually was of actually it being yeah. that way like this just kind of dirty filthy kind of city and i mean i'm sure it's nicer now and you oh, know yeah. i've never been to new york love you new york baby yeah yeah exactly <laughs> by living in new york we're not ragging on your city Mm-mm. but just 1970s new york was not the nicest of places it was it's a different any, time it was a different time exactly so ty we have to get into a, a subject because it, it's worth talking about and i think it's important to talk about and we'll try to navigate this without getting ourselves canceled oh lord here but, we go uh, but we might this could be the final episode of tau capes if so thank you for watching thank you guys thank you to all 190 subscribers that we had yep. before we were removed from the platform. <laughs> Appreciate that. So we were we kind of both, we were kind of talking about before this movie, um, we knew there was at least one scene uh, because Popeye Dole, he is a racist. He's a racist. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a secret. Mm-hmm. And there was a scene originally in this film, again, where they're roughing up the uh, the uh, uh, the guy in the very first scene they go into with, with the Santa Claus outfit that runs from him in the bar. Right. He ends up slashing Cloudy on the arm uh, and cutting him, and they end up roughing him up into, in like, you know, the alley that you mentioned, that kind of derelict mm. kind, of, kind of alleyway. And there's a scene afterwards where Popeye and uh, Cloudy are kind of back at, I guess, police headquarters, police yeah. precinct, and they're kind of having a little conversation. And there's a part where um, Popeye drops the N-word. Yes. Uh, and... We were watch- we were both watching the movie. We both knew that scene existed in mm-hmm. the film, and we were like, "Oh well, you know, let's do we do we do we bring it up?" The conversation we had when we were like before we even watched the film again, do we we do we remark on it? And we we're like, "Well, let's watch it, and if we feel it's necessary, we'll right. we'll remark about it." And it probably wouldn't have been something we were actually even brought up had it actually been in the film anymore yes like if we'd have watched it and that scene would have been included i probably wouldn't have felt the need to address it yeah it you just, just been easily, part of it. We easily said Popeye's yeah. just a racist but the fact is that apparently a few years ago i guess in the, the criterion collection or something like that did a re-edit of this film and removed most of that scene and most of that conversation and removed the use of Popeye using the n-word mm-hmm. and why we want to bring it up and talk about it is because there was there's a, there's a, a lot of factors here. So one, let's just talk about that. It it, it while not right, obviously, obviously, and we're not endorsing the no, use of that no. word or anything like that. We're not like, oh no, my precious N word got removed out of this film. Right. It's not like that. It's about um, one. It's about creators' intent and mm-hmm. about changing art to the sensibilities of the day right there's a conversation in that it's like taking a famous book and changing it for modern day sensibilities is that right or is that wrong right Taint, taking a film as it was originally intended and changing it for the modern sensibilities is that right or wrong to me i don't agree with it i, agree. I don't agree i whatever was put out was intended by the the, the creator of that piece of media that art that artist that filmmaker whatever it is for better or worse it should be left there now why am i defending that because in this film i think it does add context Mm -hmm. is it like an important does it make or break the film no No. but it leads to that context to see further about what this character is because it's in there to show that this guy's kind of a piece of shit Mm -hmm. and it's in there to show that he he's intolerant and he's he doesn't have um patience for many people but he, he he has a has more of a deep-seated anger and that kind of you know uh with the undertone of racism built into it you know he doesn't really tolerate anybody but when it comes to minorities and things like that he's even more intolerant and it, like it paints a picture of the character and adds some more context to it that you wouldn't necessarily get without it you can argue whether or not it's needed you still understand it without it yes i get that part right but it, it goes to the fact of like you know, when you're, we both watched this digitally as well. And then 
people, you buy something, and it's not the reason either of us own this film, but you buy something digitally and that somebody, a, co- a company, a corporation can go back in and change that mm-hmm. pe- that that thing that you bought because you're not buying the work itself. You're buying a certificate to watch the work right. as long as it remains uploaded by that that platform or whatever. And it should be mentioned that this this was a 20th Century Fox picture, which is now owned by Disney, which right. you can read into that, the reasons why this was probably um, changed by by Disney or whoever did it, you know, the subsidiary or whatever. One other point I'll mention before we get your perspective, Todd. Another thing it's important to remember, so you remove the scene where Popeye drops the <clears throat> N-word, but you also leave in the scene where I think two to three times he uses a racial slur against Hispanic people. Right. So what? Where's yeah, the line? That's the where's the line? What, what kind of can of worms have you opened here? Are you trying to say one is worse than the other? Yeah, and I mean, you, we're not here to debate which more which word has more impact than mm-hmm. the other. In the grand scheme of things, they're both looked at as racial slurs to whatever group of people they're uh, spoken towards. So you're then getting into kind of a battle of which are you trying to say one is more right than the other? Right. When it's if you just left it as is, people can understand the context of it and they can draw from what whatever they want to. But like that's another part about it that bugs me. It's not just its removal. If you're going to remove it, why not remove some you of the other? Remove it all. Yeah, why not yeah. remove the other racist remarks that are made to other ethnicities and minorities? Like, right, exactly. That part I don't understand. But what what's your perspective on it here, Todd? I've talked a lot about uh, this. I'm with you. I mean, I, I believe that a artist, writer, painter, whatever, their original intent, I think, should be preserved. Now, obviously, I, I don't agree with these words, these epitaphs. It's, it's not the way I think. It's not the way I've ever felt. But I think you you have to you have to leave that artist's original intent in there. Now, if you need to slap 50, 60, 70 kind of disclaimers in front of this movie, if you need to put it in a package and let me know, hey, this has, you know, blah, 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 this is of its time, you know, consume or watch at your own risk, fine. And I think we've seen that done before with some past works. Like, to have a disclaimer, this is a film made in a different time. It may use language that's offensive to others or whatever it says. I think I may be wrong. I think at one time uh, Gone with the Wind actually may have had something like that on streaming before it ever actually played or something in the description of it. But do that. And definitely if I'm buying it now, digitally or physically i want to know if this has been edited when i purchased this physically i mean not physically but digitally a couple months back i got it on sale on uh, you know a digital platform it was there was nothing mentioned about this Mm -hmm. being edited uh, edited for content edited for you know you know obviously you know racial Mm -hmm. epitaphs nothing like that so i thought i was buying the original french connection as it originally aired back in 1971 and that's not what i got and you know, I'm being sold a bill of goods there, I think. I'm being yeah. lied to. Yeah, it's either it's either put a disclaimer and put it as is or sell it to me and let me know. Let me make a decision as a consumer to know yeah. that this is an edited product or give me both. Give me yeah. both versions. Give, give me, me my choice. Yeah. Give me a, you can watch this yeah. as in, as originally theatrically released in 1971, or you can you can watch the Criterion re-edited version to mm-hmm. remove some of the the the, the epitaphs and all this kind of stuff that you were mentioning. It's you got to be more. You, if you're going to do this, you've got to you've got to let the consumer know because like yeah. I've had this bought on iTunes forever. I again I have I've watched it years ago. I've had it bought on iTunes forever just because I know it's a, an amazing movie and it was mm-hmm. on sale and I and I, I wanted to have it yeah. in my digital library and then when this come up it just raises those questions of like what what are you owed from a company that you purchased something from are you you should be owed at least the knowledge of like what you're buying yes. and if that has been altered in some way it should be presented to you maybe we didn't research it enough maybe we need to go back and see maybe there is something on iTunes I, I, to be fair I didn't look but I don't think there is right I don't think there's any acknowledgement of this has been touched or re-edited or this is this version yes. of it like give me some kind of choice there and like you said I I my point was that let the art speak for itself and you know 
if something is overtly racist or made as propaganda or made to be intentionally uh, hurtful to any one demographic, that stuff gets weeded out on its own. Right. That stuff gets, you know, yeah. I'm not talking about like just the proliferation of like intentionally racist bullshit. I'm talking mm. about like, you know, a film like The French Connection that was released in 1971. This was a, a nationwide release. This was a big film. Mm-hmm. This has been, again, it's one of AFI's top 100 American films ever made. I want to see that as it was intended. I yeah. don't want someone to change that for me. And if you do, you tell me before I give you my money so I can decide to do it. You know, I don't want people to say, well, are you talking about just like, you know, let anything out there? No, that stuff gets put in its own right. When a book gets released that's that's overtly racist or has, you know, that, that goes against one nationality or religion or whatever, creed, color, all that stuff, it, that stuff gets weeded out and you're, you're told and you can make mm-hmm. up your own mind whether you want to consume that media. But like something like this is a different category, I think. Yeah. And I just don't agree with the decision. And I think from the research I was doing when this actually kind of come up, I think this happened last year, maybe. I think it's just recently. It was very yeah. recently. Yeah. I could be wrong. And, and people were kind of, I seem to be from what I was reading in the research and kind of some of the old tweets I was seeing kind of brought up, there seemed to be most people kind of are in the same agreement with us. And even if you're not, I understand everybody has a, oh, yeah. has oh, a yeah. point of view on it. But this is just our point of view on it. And I just think it's... If you're going to do it, I think, you know, maybe the debate is not whether or not to do it or not. I think the debate is if you do it for whatever your reason, you need to inform me as a consumer. Exactly. So I can make an informed decision about the content I'm choosing to buy through your platform. I think my biggest thing is 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 let me make the choice. I don't want the choice made for me. Right. And, you know, I, being an older guy, I, you know, I'll open up this can of worms, uh, your physical media folks. Uh, you know, physical media is a pain in the ass. It takes up your space. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I unloaded a lot of my physical media last year because I was out of space. I'm out of space for anything I want to collect anymore. But, yeah. you know, your physical media, it, it, it's, you know, if you, if you bought it back in the day, it's not altered. They yeah. can't go back in and change your physical media. It's physical media. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there. This is this is definitely leads to that debate between physical and digital. I'm, yeah. I'm someone that's more in the digital realm, and these are the drawbacks of it: is that I don't own the content when I buy something digitally, and yeah. Disney or whoever can go back and change this, and I don't really have much say in that unless I own it outright. So yeah. for me, I'll unless I buy a copy of the French Connection, I'll never see that version of it. Yeah, and it don't break my heart but the that's not the point yep it's a choice that was taken from us and you know i, I just don't like it <laughs> right. i understand so folks if you're still with us yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, yeah so uh, i think i think enough said about that so again if you if you have a different perspective or anything on it like i said as long as we keep it um you know um classy yeah. in the comments we'd love to kind of hear from you yeah like, we don't you know, I, we don't want this to be taken wrong we're not the defending the use of any of this language or anything like that this is just about the interpretation of art and uh also the uh what's owed to a consumer so I exactly think, i think is our points so todd uh you ready to get into the review our last review ever <laughs> <laughs> our final review, our final yeah. review here uh, well, let me let me set up here. Uh, okay. We rank films on a one to ten scale. I done got thrown off by all this time. I'm so <laughs> worried right now. Uh, we rank films on a one to ten scale, starting from one. The ranks are torture, two awful, three bad, four subpar, five mediocre, six decent, seven good, eight great, nine amazing, ten masterpiece. Todd, give us your final thoughts and review score for French Connection. Uh, for final thoughts, I just had a couple little things I wanted to throw in about the film. Uh, this was based on real life New York City detectives Eddie Egan and Sonny Grosso. Uh, this was a famous 1960s drug bust that it was at the time, one of the biggest in American history, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, other than being consultants on the film, uh, both the original detectives were actually in the movie. I did uh, not know that. Eddie Egan was uh, their supervisor, Simonson, the one that took, you know, gave him the wiretaps, took him oh, off the case. Oh, really? Okay. That was Eddie Egan. Okay. And uh, Grosso was actually the other federal agent that wasn't killed. I think his name in the movie was Clyde Klein. That's what Clyde I had Klein. in my notes. Yeah. Clyde Klein, okay. <laughs> so they were actually in the film. Uh, this movie was turned down by almost every major studio in Hollywood before it finally got greenlit at Fox. I can see why. Uh, five Oscar wins, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor for Gene Hackman, Screenplay, and Film Editing. Yes. It really mopped up at the Oscars. I do I do remember seeing that. 
And uh, my review for The French Connection, uh, I'm going to give this movie an 8. I think it's great. Uh, this is one of those, I think, American cinema classics. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a good movie. It's a good police procedural crime movie, and I like these type of films. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so I kind of wrote up a little review here. The French Connection isn't a Hollywood film. It's a gritty, in-your-face film whose on-screen characters blur the line between policeman and criminal and whose real-life director at times may have blurred the line between artist and criminal. <laughs> uh, but there's no doubt that The French Connection has earned its place on the short list of all-time must-see films. I give The French Connection an 8 out of 10, which ranks it as great. Todd, tell everyone how they can find us and get in touch with us on social media until the end of this week <laughs> when we'll be removed from the platform. Act now, folks, but we are currently at uh, Tail Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, Tail Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also blow us up at Pod <laughs> at gmail.com. Uh, if you enjoy the show, uh, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel while it remains up. <laughs> uh, Popcorn Mums will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time. Bye, guys. I'll miss you guys. Later. <laughs>